Uh, nearly a decade ago, in 2011, Carol and I took a trip to Discover, Florida, and joined the vast flock of snowbirds. We drove down the east coast, the Atlantic side of Florida, uh, explored the Keys, went to the Everglades, and then back up the west coast to the Gulf side of Florida. In one very unique location called to us, um, a little historic town in the greater Tampa Bay area with the inviting name of Tarpon Springs. And one of the main attractions in Tarpon was a lovely, stately UU church. We visited, found the congregation to be warm and welcoming. They even helped us to find our first seasonal rental nearby. And so in 2012, we spent our first winter there. Little did we know what would lie ahead for the <laughs> UU Church in Tartan Spring. You can see the, the, the little star on the map here, west coast, the Gulf Coast of Florida, uh, near uh, the greater Tampa Bay area, but sort of off by itself. It's a small uh, community. And um, as someone had mentioned earlier, known at one time and I think still calls itself the sponge capital of the world. Sponge diving was a huge uh, industry in Tarpon. That is what really put it on the map. Uh, you can see on this slide there are quite a few sponges on the dock. You can still buy sponges of all type, natural sponges. The church was founded in 1885, and its original home was in the upper meeting room above a saloon. Everybody likes that detail. The uh, original building was a frame church on Safford Avenue, but it was a frame building. And even though uh, it was used by many other congregations in this town, uh, it did burn down in an electrical storm. We are proud of the fact that our history goes back so far because we are, in fact, the oldest universalist church in Florida. This is the original church at its, at its current location. Back behind it a little ways is a building that's now our offices. But since the first building burned, this church was built of blocks, concrete blocks or cement blocks. You can see that some of the upper the vents on the bell tower had been closed in, but this is what the original sanctuary looked like. There were windows with these lovely arches on all four sides of the building. There was a beautiful bell tower where you entered the sanctuary. The church was built, uh, opened to the public in 1908. This is a painting of Spring Bayou, which is only uh, two blocks from our church. It's a major center of uh, activities in town of Tarpon. They, we had the annual art fair there. Uh, the Greek, uh, Greek Orthodox Church has their epiphany ceremony there. This was painted by George Ennis Jr. in 1925. The father, uh, George Ennis, and then his son, George Ennis Jr., after him, began to use Tarpon Springs as their winter home. Both of them considered Tarpon Springs to be a type of Eden, and it inspired a lot of work from both of them. The paintings in the sanctuary were originally began to be created after those gorgeous windows were either blown out or damaged in some way in a, a tropical storm in 1918. This is a picture of George Ennis Jr. in his, in his uh, study where he did his paintings. And we're very fortunate to have had a member that applied for and was successful in getting George Ennis Jr. inducted into the uh, State of Florida uh, Artists Hall of Fame. So this uh, plaque was given to our church in recognition of her hard work. This is after the windows were blown out. For some reason, the decision was made to close 
all the windows in the church. So on the left side here, you'll see that the, the altar has three paintings behind it. Behind that is a velvet curtain. Uh, on the right-hand side is a picture. The one in, at, in front of the altar, behind the altar, is called uh, the 23rd Psalm. The one on the right-hand side is called The Lord is in His Holy Temple. You'll probably see more of these as time goes on. This is a fairly current picture of the sanctuary. Uh, and you see those same two paintings highlighted. It was a nice looking building, but we had on both the walls and the ceiling, we had insulated tiles, like um, soundproofing tiles. So it was a little old and outdated, and it was also very dark. It was like a cave until somebody came on and flipped on the lights, with no windows at all. However, the presence of the George Ennis Jr. paintings in our sanctuary did give us a little bit of a boost because we had tour buses coming, especially from Tampa and St. Petersburg, for people to look at the paintings. That's how well known they are. And it was, it's always an enlightening story when we give tours. Sadly, in 2013, Shortly after we called a new minister, we discovered sinkholes. That was on the Monday right before Thanksgiving in 2013. So what they did is they said we couldn't even go in the buildings anymore. So we were thrown out. We had to donate our turkeys that year to another UU church. The ground remediation took a uh, full three years from 2014 through 2016. Then we had the recovery. Those sinkholes were filled. Uh, there was a lot of work that was done. First of all, the sinkholes had to be defined very, very carefully. Then the holes had to be filled with concrete. And then finally, the sanctuary and its adjacent buildings were jacked up from their original position. Helical piers were inserted into the ground and on top of those was a big L-shaped bracket and that's the, the buildings currently sit on those 56 of those helical pier brackets that go around the entire perimeter and some under load-bearing walls inside. So uh, that was a very lengthy process. One of the things that one of the benefits of that is we we were able, and when I say we, I mean Renee, uh, rediscovered a lot of the individual structure of the place. So, Renee? All right. This process started when we got a little money and, uh, and we started uh, fixing some buildings. Plus, we knew that the paintings uh, were due to go to, on exhibit at the Lipa Radner Museum in a big, uh, in a show. So we had decided that we were going to remodel a bit the greater sanctuary. And of course, we had this $25,000 to fix up a, a room. The room is the, the three uh, little uh, arches on the far left side of the building, which is the forum room. And $25,000 doesn't buy you much. And that building had a lot of problems. And, you know, people were talking about, you know, painting the walls and reupholstering the furniture. And I said, well, why don't we take a look at why the corner of the building is six inches lower than the rest of the building? And of course, that started. Uh, a can of worms that eventually led to the discovery of the sinkholes, and it kind of brings us up to date. But this picture was pivotal in, in some of the information that came out of it, because to the right of that blank wall, there are two windows, and those windows um, 
you could kind of see that they were kind of still there, but they were buried underneath all the anything and everything over time rather than spend accordingly to fix things. We had done our best with what we had. And over time, this little chapel, which was a lovely little building, nothing great architecturally, but it had a uh, character. All the character had disappeared. Uh, the windows were essentially gone and it looked like a crypt inside. As part of the process of trying to figure out how we were going to remodel, I said, well, I think those windows, you know, might be there. And, uh, and we discovered, see this uh, on the picture on the right that has the white paint and its arch, that's a piece of masonite. And essentially we were holding our breath that the paintings were all protected. And this is what was keeping the outside uh, from the inside. And it was totally inadequate. The windows that had been essentially destroyed by the 2018 hurricane were in fact still there, broken as it was. But that kind of gave us a move to say, okay, maybe we could replace these three windows and at least we let some light in. But of course, in the process, as with everything on an old building, you discover that there's always more and more and more and more. <laughs> and on the picture on the left, when, uh, when Innes's a widow decided to bequeath the church, the paintings, uh, she turned the place into a shrine to him. And uh, so everything that had mention of Innes wound up being plastered all over the building. And in here, we had two paintings that had hung in the Louvre for a while. And there she took out uh, essentially what was the main entry into that part of the church and, uh, and put a painting on top, which you saw uh, in, in an earlier picture. So we started peeling back the onion and some of the peeling was great because it revealed the historic character of the building, but some of the peeling revealed that we had asbestos. And you see, here's the, if on the picture, there's that pink lit section, that's the outside main entrance today. Uh, and they had arbitrarily, you know, blocked it in and put a, a skylight on top and, and then had added another building to make it into an official entrance, which was, of course, by that point, full of termites and totally rotten. Uh, and in the process of remediation, and this is, this is to the level that the building was destroyed from the inside. I mean, the building, as we had it then, was an old building, it was crumbling and what have you, but it was all intact. And when they started drilling these piers, see these pipes are going, these are the helicals that Ann was talking about. They drilled into the ground and shook the whole building up. And then when they put strength on it, it cracked the building left and right, which created a new set of problems. So in the midst of all of this destruction, they said, well, we need to get to uh, an outside wall to get to uh, do some of this work we need to destroy at least side, the sidewall of a building that you will see. But I said, you mean you're going to do the demolition for us so we can expose the whole facade of the building? And of course, what it was also was that the termites had done the demolition for us too. So I came up with a concept to expose the whole facade. And once the facade was exposed, we could then restore even more windows and we would put a terrace because the old entrance was just a little thing around the tower. So this would make the transition between both buildings and it would give us going forward a site that could be rented out for weddings. And, you know, it would give us definition, a lot more definition that we had had. That drawing and then drawings that came out of it uh, were presented to the historic board. And here we are uh, at, on the picture on the right is the whole group that attended the meeting here in Tarpon Springs. And of course the town loved it uh, because they got you know, their church back and they didn't have to lift a finger for it. Uh, and uh, on the left is the board 
uh, inside the building after it had been cleared of everything, the paintings are gone. Essentially, I was telling them, this is what we want to do, and this is where we're going. And, uh, and I had been given, essentially, carte blanche to put this together. Uh, and I tried to do it within the bounds of the building as it existed. It was never, uh, you know, Renee wants it this way. It, this is what it was. I was just taking out all that had been added. We had a, a whole bunch of hiccups with contractors, and we had a contractor who was doing the parsonage because the parsonage was also affected. The character who was in charge of that uh, had taken over the project because this fellow who is sitting there with Kathy holding the permit, uh, who was my initial choice for a contractor and who was a man who knew about historic buildings and had a passion for it, had fallen out because this thing started as a, a $99,000 remodel. And Gerhardt, you know, said, okay, yeah, we can do it for that. And then it wound up costing uh, considerably more because every single turn, uh, a new thing got revealed. So Gerhardt, we had lost as a contractor because of the time period between making decisions and finally getting to where we needed to be. And then eventually we had the other guy and then he bowed out because he was incapable of doing the job. So we wound up getting Gerhardt back and Gerhardt did the remodel. And here is part of the that little room that you saw at the beginning. Uh, with the three arches, and we saved the only thing that was historic because the rest was totally eaten by termites, and we rebuilt it all in concrete block. And then here is the reconstruction of that with, as I always label it, the nuclear slab, because uh, the engineers uh, uh, were so adamant that this thing had to have reinforcement for you know, landing a Boeing 747 on it, uh, and uh, my argument was always, well, you know, in Florida, if things crack, you know you have a problem. In this case, when the sinkhole, if the sinkholes come back, it, it will take the whole slab, and that's when we'll find out. And as you see, this is the inside being put back together. And on the picture on the left, you can see actually a major crack that had never been there. And those arches, when we first took the building on, and open them, the, the doorways would swing in and out beautifully. And over time, just because of all the remediation work, they all were slowly collapsing. So we had, you know, in order to save the building, we had destroyed the building. Now we had to resave it again some more. The picture on the right is the sanctuary going back to its full height ceiling that had, at one, when we were congregants there at the beginning, had a drop acoustic tile with fans, and it was just awful. And here you see a lot of metal studs, again, taking away any future uh, for termites to eat anything. And you see, this is what we you used to see. This is how we entered the church uh, through the far right. That's a red door, sort of. You see, this building, in as much as it served a function, uh, because they always said, well, you know, we needed this building that they called a narthex because the buses and people could sit there. And I said, well, they're coming here to see the building. They're, they're coming here to see the paintings. Let them sit in the building and see the paintings. And by removing that building, which was also as a fact of the, that they needed to get through it to make the repairs. The other side, where it was just a slab, the city condemned that building. It had to come down. And here you see maybe some of the reasons why on the right. This is termite and repairs uh, that were, it, it was just a free for all, you know, of what was going on. You start with one plan and you wind up in the place you need to be. And I think, I think this is where you go in, Kathy, right? Well, we thought we would kind of reach a stopping point here where we're at um, in ruins, basically. So, yeah. it, those of, the, of us that lived through this, it felt like it happened in two parts. There was the, the going downhill part, you know, where everything got worse and worse and more expensive and our problems got bigger and bigger. 
and we have taken you up to that point. Um, and that kind of strengthened us that, you know, making lemonade out of lemons. There's a lot of lemonade stories, but a lot of the people who joined our church joined it when they had only been to the recreation center. They'd never ever stepped foot inside of the church. So it was all new to them. And the fact that they would still join us, even though we were in this situation, was a testament to, you know, we kept church going. We said, let's don't not do something just because we don't have a building. Let's find a way to do it anyway. Uh, let, let's don't just shut down our, our mission. Um, and that was another thing that we had to learn how to do. That was the biggest mission because we thought everything was about the church and the paintings. And eventually it was about the people that survived and fought to put it all back together. And we were forced to go out and partner with other groups in the community to do, yeah. you know, social justice projects and things like that. Um, and we found that those partnerships made us stronger. You know, it really is the lemonade that Kathy was talking about. Uh, none of it was easy, but you know, I can't remember half of the bad things that happened because <laughs> that's not what I remember. <laughs> medications and medications. Okay. <laughs> We're so pleased to have with us again this morning the members of the UU Church of Tarpon Springs who were most deeply involved in the process throughout. Kathy, Ann, and Renee, welcome again to our forum. Here is what we had to look at. And um, well, you couldn't see on the right side, the termite damage, but certainly over time, all the good intentions of a lot of uh, well-intentioned uh, members had essentially obstructed the church with either blocking the windows, adding buildings in front of the main entrance, um, letting the landscape grow so you couldn't really see. And even at one point there was a fence uh, all around the property to keep everyone at bay. So um, the process, was clear that if we wanted to be a community church, we needed to be part of the community and we needed to uh, uh, put it back uh, into some different uh, look. So the first thing that went uh, was this building that, as I said before, had uh, the people that were making the remediation needed access uh, underneath the church so that they could pin. And you can see in the slide on the left, two kind of concrete patches underneath those uh, blocked windows, uh, which were these massive holes that they had to cut in. And in order to cut through that, they had to essentially demolish practically half of that building. Um, and, um, and then um, here's the old, uh, well, not even the old, there were some of the you can see the main stairs, which are the big ones. And in the corner, you see kind of like a little half moon round stairs. Those were the original stairs that uh, created a little terrace before and all of that all went. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the new terrace brought back the whole approach and the windows and exposed, um, you know, the rose window, which is the circle um, above those two other windows that you saw before. Uh, and that's actually lit at night now. And the terrace is a, a very welcoming uh, place. And we use both doors as opposed to none of the original doors. Uh, and the building is pretty much as it was uh, when it was built in 1908. Next. And here is the original facade um, of the uh, forum room 
And um, for whatever reasons, and I suspect it was finances, this wall was made out of concrete block and then everything else was made out of wood. Uh, and the wood over a hundred years of rain coming off of the side of the building without gutters had undermined the building uh, to cause in part some of that sinking. And of course, fostered a, a community of uh, termites that had eaten literally the entire wall. Uh, it was the stucco that held the walls in place uh, when we opened up um, and, and the wood was totally gone. Um, uh, we made an alteration here. Uh, as you see, the original angle of the roof is, is left, but we put the ceiling height up to the ceiling height and pitch of the rest of the building um, just to keep it consistent and uh, to shed better the water and uh, also to have a place to put our uh, our second rose window that had been removed uh, from another part of the building and now could be enhanced uh, this facade. Uh, and you can see here it is from the inside partially, well, in operation and uh, in, in the process of insulation and uh, uh, and you know we use spray foam insulation and we essentially sprayed every square inch of that um, wood because you know it's block up to um, where you can see the wood uh, joints and uh, all of that was sprayed with a, a thermaticide uh, to make sure that uh, they don't need it because unless you use all, all that product, that wood is kind of like candy for termites uh, because it's young wood that's never hard pine like the original wood was uh, in most of the building. Um, and here's members using already the, you know, the, um, the forum room. Uh, with all new windows, well, uh, because even though the windows here were original, um, we had new hurricane proof and hurricane proof doors uh, installed. Um, which is code. Which is, you know, Florida code. Uh, yeah. All right. So, so the next group of slides we're going to talk about um, has to do more with, with the people. <laughs> uh, Renee's walked us through the construction and what it took to, to rebuild the, the buildings. Um, but while all that was happening and it took years, what, what became of our congregation? So uh, the first two slides we're gonna show you have to do with when we were displaced and what happened with the paintings. Um, and I'll ask Anne if she'll speak to those two, and then I'll come in and talk about some bring your own bucket work days that we had and our return to campus, as well as some of our current day artists got a chance to display their work. And then uh, we will close today with our music director, Bonnie, performing um, a song, Love is the Spirit of this Church, that she customized to our situation. Um, so Anne, you want to talk about our displacement in the paintings? Uh, certainly. Uh, the uh, sinkholes were actually discovered in 2013 on the Monday, just four days before Thanksgiving. And like most UU churches, we had planned a Thanksgiving dinner and a Christmas dinner and all that. So while not only did we have to uh, notify everybody that we were out of the building and would not be able to have those services or you know the the meals together but we had to find a place for our uh, the turkeys we had ordered to go to a different UU church as well as some of our folks although as it turns out everyone was kind of bummed and not too many people went but it was the Clearwater Church and um they were very thankful to get our turkeys, and I'm sure they uh, 
donated what whatever was left since they had already made their own arrangement. Now, the these paintings had actually um, been scheduled to go on loan. These are the Ennis paintings you see in both uh, photographs, but they had been scheduled to go to the Lipa Retner M Museum of Art, which is also in Tarpon Springs. And it was a big and very well publicized uh, exhibition. And uh, they, uh, in a, in, well, prior to that, we had to have the paintings appraised so that the museum, while they had them in their care, would have adequate insurance coverage in case they were damaged or, or destroyed somehow. At any rate, uh, they did a marvelous job with the displays. Everyone who went over to the museum was thrilled to see how beautifully they were displayed. But to our great good fortune, they also allowed us to have a Sunday morning service at the museum so that we could once again be surrounded by the paintings of George Ennis Jr. And we were all feeling pretty cocky then that we had some pretty great <laughs> art. I think you can see from these, uh, the photograph on the right, how truly monumental some of these paintings are. They're quite large. And um, I think that's it for me, Kathy. All right. So this is the recreation center where we finally ended up at, at when we were first displaced, we ended up at the Elks Lodge, right, <laughs> Ann, which was kind of like a bar, a setting. It was yes. uh, not very good atmosphere for a worship service, but were we there, what, what six months or something before we, we were there about six months. And during that time, we could actually see the deterioration of the men's and ladies' rooms as they deteriorated. <laughs> yeah, and, and it was right up at the front. So if you had to go to the restroom, you had, you know, everyone watched you walk into it and heard you flush. It was, it was not so good. So we ended up at the rec center and that's what you're seeing here. And as you can see, it's just very bland. And this was our improvement <laughs> in the top picture there. It was just all beige, but it was clean and quiet. But we soon brought life to it. So this was an opportunity for our current day artists, uh, Karen Strobin and Bill Luxinger. They're nationally known. You can Google them. Um, they were able to come in and turn the Venetian blinds into a clipboard <laughs> and, um, and bring these gorgeous big prints. And they even gave us a session where they kind of explained some of their inspiration behind their art. So. Every Sunday we would bring things to liven up the place and we kind of made it our own space, made it intimate and warm and inviting. Um, so that's the way that we kept our mission alive even, even while we didn't have the best of circumstances. So this is an opportunity we had to get our members engaged in the process. So the, on the left side, you see our social hall here. This is the one part of the building that was not impacted by the sinkholes. This is this was the good part of the building that you see here. And over the years, while it was kind of waiting for the rest of the building to get uh, restored, there was a, just a lot, of, a lot of junk, a lot of filth. Uh, you can see the ceiling was in bad shape. There had been some uh, wood damage and rain leakage uh, to the roof. So we had work days and invited members, friends, everybody, even if you're not fit, you could bring lemonade and cookies for us and just enjoy the action. Uh, so here's a before and after picture. This is our social hall before we opened and after. What did we call those work days, Kathy? BYOB, bring your own bucket. And people literally brought their own bucket and cleaning materials. And you can see here um, on the right, this bulletin board, it was ratty, nasty, ugly burlap bulletin board. We're like, what do we do with that? Because we didn't want to spend any more money dealing with repairing the walls or anything. And Karen and Bill came up with this gorgeous print of um, the bayou that's very close to us. And it was just a perfect thing for that wall. So this is another space we had. Um, this used to be a library, but you can see what it became, <laughs> a kind of a junk room. 
And um, once we got done with it, we turned it into a really nice space for our kids. And one of the things I'll, I'll comment on here is we hadn't been in the space for like five years or six years. And so we had a lot of decisions to make about how the space would be used. And of course, a lot of different opinions about how the space should be used. So we ended up, the board decided that they would appoint two people, a team of two people to kind of make the decisions and, and what they said would, would be it. It was me uh, who at the time I was the current president and then our past immediate past president who had also been on the building committee. We were the two people. So we would listen to what people thought and then we would make the decision and then that was it. So um, it helped to have a, a clear, clear decision makers for, for this period of time here. And then we had to rescue our pews. So these pews were original to the building uh, back in 1908, but they were in bad shape. And when we brought them out of storage, they also had termites all in them. So we got a U-Haul truck. We loaded all the pews in the U-Haul truck and then everything else that we could find that was wood, we threw it in the U-Haul truck and we fumigated that thing. Uh, and then carried them back out. The, we did all this work ourselves. We were trying to save money. Um, but again, it's an opportunity, right, for people to, to feel part of this. So the pews needed some repair. They had to be reinforced. We had, you know, people are heavier these days than they were back in the early 1900s. And those pews couldn't stand the weight of, you know, six people sitting on them. So uh, one of our members, a few of our members, rigged up a way to put some supports in the middle of the pews. And then we had some special um, materials that we used to restore the finish on the, on the pews. And then our members, young and old, big and small, carried them in one by one and placed them in the sanctuary for us. And this picture also shows the wood floors. Uh, those had been in terrible shape. You saw the picture last time of how they had the big machinery in there and they just made holes in the floors. So we were fortunate that the floors were able to be restored and, um, and, and brought back to a beautiful finish. And here is the sanctuary all finished. And I will tell you, when you walk into that space, it just the feeling you would get that it was spacious, you know, the ceiling, high ceilings. It was quiet because of all that insulation that and, and the modern day quality windows. Um, everything was clean that we had brand new AC system. So it smelled fresh and clean. And there was just such um, a spiritual feeling in that space. It was, and you were surrounded by the paintings, which were made for that space, literally made for that space. And um, it's just a feeling you get in there. And even our visitors felt the same way when they would come. It was just uh, such an ideal place to have a worship service. And here we are, this was our ribbon cutting ceremony. Um, the thing that I remember about this is it's when we real or when I realized for the first time that over the time, over those years that we were out of our building, what partnerships we had formed in the community. We were forced to. <laughs> um, but when we had this, first of all, the chamber said, we want to do a ribbon cutting ceremony for you. <laughs> um, and the community showed up. I mean, this is the mayor right here. Um, these are people from the chamber, um, you know, head of the AME church, and uh, who, who also, they had sinkholes, and, and they were at the rec center, and we got to know them and did projects with them. Um, so the whole community came and helped us celebrate. And that was the day that... Um, I presented to the congregation this refuse to sink plaque that was actually mounted on a piece of salvaged wood from the, the uh, old Wayne's cotting, I think. Um, so it was a real time to celebrate. And we scheduled um, several 
reopening ceremonies around that time. We had a, a piano, a classical piano concert on the stage. We had an art opening, this, a wine and cheese, and a speaker come and talk to us about uh, the Ennis paintings. And then we had a worship service where we invited ministers and um, you know, guests of honor from different churches around to come and join us for rededicating the sanctuary. So we tried to make the most of our uh, reopening celebrations. So this is one of our very first worship services back in the sanctuary. This is what it looks like with people there. And in this view, I think the big thing to, to point out is the light. You remember before the renovations, there were no windows in there. And now you can see it's just filled with lights. And another thing, again, how decisions were made, you notice we have the chairs over in this one section and pews in the rest of the uh, building there. Um, there was a big debate. Should we, when we come back, keep the pews that are kind of old fashioned and uncomfortable and, and you can only arrange the room one particular way with pews or should we go to chairs? And so that was a decision that we deemed was too important for just a committee to make. So we took it to the whole congregation and the pews won, although this one section was chairs so that people that were in wheelchairs or had special needs could have a, a flexible place there. Um, so only 13 people voted for chairs, but every Sunday we see that that section with the chairs fills up the quickest before the pews. And you see Anne Rainey at the podium there talking to us. <laughs> this is another view of the sanctuary filled with people. And this is from the opposite wall. And you will notice the art on the walls is not the Ennis paintings. And what happened is we had been in the church a few months and we noticed some signs of termites. And here the termites had gotten into the wooden frames of some of the paintings. And so we were advised we needed to take the paintings off site. So a few months after we had been in the sanctuary, the paintings had to leave and uh, they were treated for termites. But again, our artists, Karen and Bill came through and prepared these large colorful prints. Uh, so we still had a, a festive uh, nice place to worship. And this was last season. You can see Dennis and Carol in the choir. Here's a, a better view of them. There you are. <laughs> so we wanted to be sure to include this picture just for you guys. You can see familiar faces there. And anybody else that wants to come down to Tarpon Springs and sing in the choir or just visit, you are most welcome. And it turned out those front steps on the stage was a great place for kids to sit and, and hear the story for all ages. So be, before we close with our song from Bonnie, I do want to mention Renee and Ann and I have talked about lessons learned. Um, as we went through this saga <laughs> and you just have to understand and give people a little leeway, even yourself. I know I felt tremendous stress and pressure to make the right decisions and handle this huge thing. You just have to be easy on yourself and easy on each other. Um, and know that we're all have, have the good intentions. We're all on the same side but we just have different ways of reacting in stressful situations. I learned one thing directly from um, uh, Renee. Renee was instrumental in coming up with plans <coughs> for the new building. Uh, he's educated in this area and he's, he's really uh, passionate about historic preservation. But one of the things I, I said kind of offhandedly is what a great job he did. Uh, I said this to Renee, uh, great job he did picking the colors for this and that and the next thing. And he said, I didn't pick a single color 
we just investigated and figured out what the colors had been when the place was originally built. And I thought that was brilliant. And we, we use that terminology uh, in our communications on colors here and there in the next place uh, so many times. And it really kept uh, our collective feet out of hot water. So kudos to you, Renee. <laughs> well, I, I did that on purpose because I did not want it to be a my decision versus the people in the church or then somebody say, well, you know, wouldn't blue look nice or wouldn't this look nice? And in a building, the building talks and you listen and that's how you do it. Um, uh, it, it was never about what I wanted done. It was about what had been original and how to bring that building back to as much original um, as it was while uh, accommodating the modern needs. Uh, but certainly we've covered uh, uh, a lot. Uh, and, and the end result, which was the most important thing, is that the building is glorious. And there is not one person that doesn't walk in that building that doesn't just uh, you know, it's all inspiring uh, from where it used to be. And anybody who's seen the two can't believe uh, that that building was there. Well, I, I just want to thank you all again so much for, uh, for coming all the way up here to visit us. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> this, this wonderful story. Uh, obviously, you didn't sink, and you ended up so much better off for all of your efforts. So thank you so much for being, uh, being for sharing your time with us. We really, really do appreciate it. Oh, the church.